Well, uh, yeah, like Jason said, they asked me to talk about fall food plots and uh, to throw in a little quality deer management. And uh, of course, those are uh, long programs that we could go in depth on either one, but I thought we'd hit the highlights of, uh, of, of both of these, more on the food plots than the QDM. He wanted me to concentrate more on fall food plots and QDM, but also uh, put in some considerations for quality deer management as you're uh, working with your food plots and, and other habitat management considerations. The first thing that I always start off with when talking about food plots is, is asking the audience, you know, why are you planting food plots? And this is a legitimate question because depending on your objectives, you would plant different plantings. And, you know, let's be honest, most people plant food plots to attract deer and, and other species, especially uh, turkeys or, or doves, for example, to aid in, in their hunting. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But a lot of people also are trying to increase the nutritional carrying capacity of their property, uh, obviously by increasing the amount of high quality nutrition that's available to deer because they wish to see increased weights and antler sizes by, by age class. And that's certainly something that can be done with food plots. But again, you wouldn't plant necessarily the same thing. And we will go through some of that but I will stress primarily this evening on fall food plots and what you would uh, be considering going forward. And just because you plant a food plot, that doesn't mean that you're only wanting or you're only uh, aiding the species that you are planting for. There are many, many species of wildlife, both game and non-game, that benefit from, from your food plots. And so uh, don't, don't let anybody belittle you for planting food plots and you're just planting something so you can kill something. That's, that's not true. There's, there's lots of species that are benefiting from the things that you're putting out there. I always stress uh, for folks to be aware that food plots do not replace population management, old field management, or managing early successional areas and forest management. It is these practices that provide what I like to call the meat and potatoes for the food that is available for whitetail deer throughout the year, but you certainly can use food plots then kind of as a dessert, or you might think of it as uh, something to hold you between meals or whatever, but this nutritional baseline should be as high as you can get it with regard to your field and forest management. That then will enable your food plots to get you to places or get the deer to elevated weights and antler sizes that you could not get to before. So don't underestimate this, do not overlook this. This is of, of paramount importance if you're really trying to maximize resources for deer on your property. Of course, one of the most common questions is how much should you plant? And the accurate answer is there is no certain percentage. And what I like to tell people is if you have exclusion cages in your forage plots, which you should, uh, it tells you all kinds of information, but if you have cages out there and at any time of the year, your food plots are eaten to the ground or you see browse lines in your woods or there are certain plants that deer uh, typically select very heavily and they are grazed or browsed off to where they're hardly present on the property anymore. These are severe uh, limitations or, or indicating severe limitations. So at that point, obviously, you need to either plant more, implement additional habitat management, and or lower deer density by shooting an increased number of does. And so you simply continue to do this and hopefully you are collecting data harvest data on the deer that you kill along the way by sex and age class to let you know what the weights and general health are of the deer uh, that, you're, that you're taking. And you put all this together and that gives you a very accurate picture of how much is available and, and what, what you need to provide, what else you need to provide. Um, another, I, I, I think it's a common sense uh, recommendation to, to not plant your food plots 
uh, where they're visible from public roads. And I think most people obviously understand that, but I like to take it a step further. Um, Jason, can you, can you see the arrow here that I'm pointing out? Yes. Okay. All right, well, what we're looking at right here is just a property road. So that's just a, a, a gravel strip or a trail where people access the property, uh, this property with an ATV. That's not a public road. And so how many times might you hear, well, I hunted that plot yesterday evening, so I won't hunt it again this evening. I'll hunt one that's, you know, down in here somewhere or on the other side of the property. But to get back to the house or the cabin, you got to drive along this road and then go right by the food plot that is right there adjacent to the, the road that you're driving ATV on. That is hunting pressure. The sound of a rifle is not hunting pressure. Your presence is hunting pressure. So you driving by this food plot just before daylight or just after dark is the same as if you had hunted here and spook deer coming in or going out. Now, alternatively, here are a couple of food plots that are on a spur road off of the property road. And so here it's at least, and, and my recommendation is at least 50 yards off of a road. When you're traveling on this with an ATV and deer are grazing in this food plot, they will lift their heads up and they will watch you drive by but then they'll put their head right back down and continue eating. Whereas if a deer was right here and you drove by, then they're running away. And as this happens, they are essentially trained not to come out into the field before it gets dark, especially not a four or five year old buck that most people are, are really interested in. So there's a lot to be said about the placement of food plots and how you manage your, your access uh, into and, and out of the area. Of course, you would want to stay away from uh, soils that are really wet during uh, key porch, key times of the year that's gonna in inhibit food plot production and growth. And I like to overlay a soils map onto the property. That gives you a look at the soils and then I'll overlay a uh, a topo map on top of that on just something like Google Earth. Everybody has Google Earth. You can go to Google, Google Earth and, uh, and overlay a soils map or a topo map with that and fade that in and out and use that to your advantage in terms of locating uh, areas where you, you want your food plots and where you don't want your food plots. Of course, your, your, your roads should be on there and you should be thinking about wind direction and your access to stand sites, et cetera. So putting all these things together really helps you with regard to coming up with the proper placement of your plot. And as you're doing that, more than likely, you're gonna find some spot where, you know, this currently is in woods right now, but man, this is the perfect place for a food plot. Don't overlook creating additional openings. Uh, to have someone come in and clear some of these openings, uh, a lot of times is not as much as you would be putting into a new rifle, for example. Um, and, and some of those fields that you might currently have that you are identifying as, you know, maybe this isn't in the best place, why not allow them to convert to cover or to, uh, to, to early succession to provide those nutritious warm season forbs during the growing season and, and help with fawning cover as well as nutrition for, for bucks growing antlers and, and does lactating. So all of those are important. I'll show you a couple of pictures of that in just a little while. But the, the thing that I'm trying to get across to folks is just because a field is open doesn't mean that's the only opportunity you have to plant. Uh, a lot of times there's opportunities to create additional openings and, and adjust what we would uh, what we would call your your property arrangement or actually the deer habitat. Arrangement. Here's an example of where we've placed a couple of food plots. Obviously, that's a corn plot on uh, on this end right here. And down here is is annual clovers and and uh, and winter wheat. But but look at this field right up here. And look at this field going all up through here. This is not planted. This is just allowed to grow into early successional vegetation. 
high quality forbs that deer select. We've killed the grass, especially the, the tall fescue that was in these fields, just allowed the seed bank to germinate. We will go into these fields once per year, once, and spot spray using either an ATV or an open cab tractor and kill the plants that we don't want and leave the plants that we do want. It's just that simple. And then after a few years, uh, we'll set that succession back by either burning or disking the field and keep that going. And so now what you're seeing is deer literally standing up out of their bed and walking into the food plot as opposed to coming from 350 yards away where there may be some thicket way back over there and then working their way up through here and then showing up after dark. And so if deer are getting out of their bed within a certain number of minutes or hours, usually within the hour before dark, why count on them having to walk from hundreds of yards away from where there was adequate bedding cover when you can juxtapose or place immediately adjacent to your food plots, good cover there. And this is just one example. Of course, back in the woods, we will have things uh, set up with strategies where we might have uh, anywhere from two to 15 acre blocks that are designed and, and managed specifically for bed and cover uh, as well. But the, the point is don't, don't overlook the importance of bedding cover and having that uh, relatively close to your food plots, you will increase the amount of daytime visitation by doing so. Of course, it's been said over and over, it still amazes me at how few people do this, but of course you should test your soil. Uh, it's cheap, it's easy, and there is no uh, better information with regard to how much you're paying for it to find out what the pH and nutrient levels are in the soil that you're planting. And then of course, to get accurate recommendations for uh, the, the amendments that you need for what you're planting on that site. With regard to food plot uh, preparation, of course you can plant plots via no-till or conventional tillage. And with no-till, you can either use a no-till drill or you can no-till top sow. Of course, no-till planting conserves nutrients and moisture and the organic material, and that's the plants that are on top of the ground right here. As those plants die and decompose, they slowly become organic matter, which then builds topsoil, uh, slow releases nutrients, increases uh, water infiltration, and over time will reduce the amount of amendments that are needed to the site, especially with regard to, to fertilizers. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't use conventional tillage. Without question, more food plots are planted with conventional tillage than, than no-till, and you can have outstanding food plots with using uh, conventional tillage, but over time, you will need uh, some more amendments than if you were using no-till. And so, we use different techniques to go about planting plots and, and some of which might not be thought about by a lot of folks. And so I just included a few pictures here. Of course, this field was sprayed, as you can see, about two to three weeks prior to when I took this picture. And so everybody's always in a hurry. And so if you simply burn that material off, that of course leaves really a perfect seed bed there that you could top sow. Obviously, you then can go in if needed with a chisel plow or a disc to work this up, and then uh, a, uh, a tillage tool or rotivator then can create a very fine seed bed, and cultipacking on top of that firms the, uh, the, the seed bed in preparation for planting, especially these light-seeded species such as clovers and brassicas and even wheat and oats, although I would prefer covering the wheat and oats a little bit uh, with a disc or the tiller prior, prior to cultipacking, and then planting or top sowing the, uh, the small seed uh, after cultipacking, and then cultipacking again to make sure you have good firm seed soil establishment. And then two, two months later, here is the results from, from such efforts. I don't think 
preparing the seed bed fine enough is something, I think that's something a lot of people don't do. They uh, don't go to the effort to get as fine of a seed bed as they could. And that generally leads to less germination and a little, uh, and a little poorer uh, seedling survival. So what should you plant? Of course, you've got to think about when are you wanting to have forage available? And so this little diagram here shows annual cool season forages. And in this case, it's wheat and crimson clover, and, uh, perennial cool season forages. And here we have ladino clover and chicory. And of course, annual warm season forages. And this shows uh, production of cow peas and lab lab. And of course, soybeans would be along that same timeline. So a couple of things to point out. One, look at what is producing most during the middle of winter. That's your annual cool season forages. The perennial cool season forages are largely dormant during midwinter. And then they really, really begin to pick up production in spring. And by early summer, that's when they're peaking. And of course, if we have decent rainfall, we might have good production on into August, but a lot of months or a lot of years, it starts getting really dry. And so this production can really wane by late August and uh, late July and going into August. But also at that time, you've planted warm season plots. And so that then takes over and it fills this window when the perennial cool season forages are going down. And it would be about this time, of course, that you are planting the annuals. And so that's how you can use different food plot plantings to fill all of the windows of, uh, of possible food limitation through the year. But again, I stress that you need to concentrate on managing your fields and, and woods as, as well as possible and finding out when the naturally occurring foods on your property are at a low level and then filling that in with food plots as well as planting some of these these other cool season crops that of course would would help in your in your hunting and I know most people are interested in that. Now along those lines with different production uh, periods, obviously you can see the advantage of planting separate acreage, both in your annual cool season plantings, perennial cool season plantings, and warm season plantings. Now, of course, both of these, corn and soybeans, are annual warm season plantings, but deer are getting eating the forage off of these uh, soybeans, of course, during the, uh, the growing season, and then of course getting the grain during fall and winter. And of course there's a little bit of grain sorghum planted over here, but not nearly as important with regard to the energy as, as the corn. And if you don't have acreage enough to do that, and let's say it's a relatively small property and, and you've only got one field, well here's a scenario where this, was, this is American joint bitch, highly selected by deer, uh, withstands grazing pressure really, really well. A lot of people don't realize the benefits of, of using uh, joint vetch, especially if they can't get their soybeans to grow, for example. But instead of destroying this whole plot in late August in order to plant clovers or brassicas or cool season grains, only a portion of the plot was cleared to plant the cool season uh, forages that you see here. And this was left to allow deer to continue to eat on this uh, through fall and until the uh, hard frost finally kills the, the joint bed. So not clearing the whole table at once is important with regard to keeping deer in an area. And uh, if you can, that's a better strategy than clearing the whole field. But hopefully you have multiple sites where, where you can plant things. Um, something else that a lot of people don't pay attention to is calculating the, uh, the rate of pure live seed. And on every seed bag, of course, you'll see a sticker that tells you the amount of pure seed that's in the, uh, the bag, as well as coating. Uh, so of course, with clovers, which are legumes, most of the seed available now will be coated, which includes the inoculant. And the inoculant uh, includes bacteria that have a symbiotic relationship with the clover that you are planting. And so when that seed germinates, that bacteria is 
present on the seed. And when the little rootlet comes out, then that bacteria is able to colonize the rootlet. And then it will form nodules that actually manufactures nitrogen that the plant can use. Obviously that reduces the need for, for nitrogen fertilization. So the point is this coating represents, as you can see, 50% of the contents of the bag. And oftentimes germination rate might only be 75 or 80%. So if you take into effect the amount of pure seed, as you can see here, I'm just calling this 49%, and multiply that by the germination rate, you get 0.44 and whatever your desired planting rate is, and let's say for in this case, you're just planting crimson clover, you would take your desired planting rate and divide that by this factor right here. And that shows you that you need to plant 45 pounds of the material in this bag to get a 20 pound per acre rate. Now, this is not as important with perennial clovers such as Ladino, because the perennial white clovers form above ground stolons, and those are above ground runners. And so the plant actually will spread on its own. But with the annual clovers, this is a big deal. And also be aware that you will have some other uh, forages such as chicory which is not a, a legume with coated seed. Now that's kind of curious. Why would they coat legume when it's not even, I mean, why would they coat, why would they coat chicory when it's not even a legume? Well, the answer would be, well, we put different things in there to help it out as soon as it germinates. Well, that's taken up a lot of the bag, usually about 35 to 40% uh, of the bag in, in that situation. So just be aware of that. And in that scenario, of course, you'd need to calculate pure live seed as well. Corn is a, is, is a warm season forage, but as I mentioned, it's available in fall, winter. So I wanted to include it here. And uh, a couple of observations and, and things about corn that uh, maybe you have or, or haven't thought about. Of course, corn has a high sugar content. And so deer and, and as you well know, many other species are highly attracted to corn. However, from about central Pennsylvania to central Michigan, along that latitude and south, there has been no such thing as a deer dying of winter starvation since the last ice age. And so although deer may flock to corn and it's fun to hunt over, and, and I do that and, and we plant corn plots, you know, at least most years, it's the most expensive thing that you can plant. So if your budget is tight, in my opinion, you would be much better off planting some green plots rather than corn plots. Now, you know, for, for folks that live way north of here and they've got heavy snow and snow is persisting literally for, for two or three weeks and longer, in those situations, something like corn or standing beans can be extremely important to help uh, deer get through winter in good shape, but we simply do not have to worry about that at this latitude. At this latitude, we're planting corn as a luxury crop that is fun to hunt over and deer like to eat it because it's sweet, but you're not really having an influence on survivability or nutritional uh, shape of the deer getting through winter because of that. And also keep in mind, corn nor acorns have ever put one inch on a deer's head. Deer do not eat them while antlers are growing and the amount of crude protein that is in corn or acorns is only between about five to 6%, which is woefully inadequate for antler growth so corn is a, a, a great planting for, for energy in the winter and an attractive uh, plot, but you're not doing that much nutritionally for deer at this latitude. Of course, there are all kinds of varieties that are available and uh, a lot of nitrogen input is needed. Of course, it is largely planted by the number of seeds per acre, but if you are broadcasting corn somewhere in the neighborhood of eight 
to 13 pounds of corn broadcast and then uh, covered an inch or two by, by disking or tilling will, will produce a good plot, especially if you've attended to uh, the uh, soil amendments. A lot of times when we plant corn, it isn't all eaten. Uh, a couple of things to think about that. Number one, that should be a great barometer for how much is needed. If, uh, if you have a lot of corn left over and, and ditto with soybeans, although that's, that's rarely the case, uh, that's, that's a great barometer for how much you, you need to plant. And the other thing is to not underestimate the value of the fallow plant communities, these early successional plant communities that are coming up uh, in, in the season after the corn is grown. You probably will not have any better uh, fawning cover or brooding cover for wild turkeys, for example, than this right here. And also don't un underestimate the forage value of many of those plants that are growing. And I wanted to stick this in here just to uh, uh, highlight a little of this before we get into the, the cool season uh, plants and, and mixtures. But uh, many of these plants are outstanding forages for white-tailed deer. And, and deer, of course, are considered a, quote, concentrate selector, meaning they concentrate their foraging on select plants and select plant parts. But by far, by far, forbs, the broadleafed herbaceous plants, are most important. And uh, even brambles, such as blackberry, you can see the amount of crude protein and relatively low acid detergent fiber levels, which is very good. In the young leaves and even in the older leaves, you have the maximum amount of crude protein that is needed for, for antler growth here. And that's on the same plant. So older leaves will be less digestible and less nutritious regardless of plant than the younger leaves. So keep that in mind. And that's why you always see deer nipping on the leaves out at the end of the twigs. And you look at the protein content, here's blackberry going through the season when deer are growing antlers and does are lactating. And you see the amount of calcium and the amount of phosphorus. Now over here is the scale for phosphorus and calcium. The maximum amount, maximum, for maximum antler production is 0.1%. So you see the amount of phosphorus is way in excess of the maximum needed for deer and the maximum amount of calcium is 0.3%, which would be a right, right here. So blackberry exceeds the nutritional demand for both maximum antler production and lactation. The same is true for plants such as pokeweed, as you can see here, very common things that we find on all of the properties around here in East Tennessee and up on the plateau, common ragweed. Look at the nutrition that's available in common ragweed. And, and notice that I took these pictures of these quote weeds in food plots. So we'll get to more of that towards the end, but keep that in mind. So look at the crude protein in blue of common ragweed through the growing season, as well as the amount of calcium. I mean, it's, it's off the charts, 1.5% and the most a buck needs is 0.3. The most uh, uh, phosphorus a buck needs is 0.1. And, and look at what's available here. So keep these things in mind and don't overlook the value of some phyla growth. And that's also an excellent way to rotate some of your food plots when productivity starts getting low and, and you're getting some truly undesirable plants coming into the plots and you need to spray that spray those out. There's nothing wrong with letting those uh, go fallow for a year in, in fallow rotation before planting something else. All right, so we'll move on here to some cool season mixtures and, and uh, I'm, I'm hitting highlights here of, of the what I consider uh, the very best and especially for, for our latitude that this easily is what I would consider the gold standard. I mean, you're, you're simply not gonna beat this. Uh, there are some other clovers that, that deer would eat as readily as crimson, such as uh, bursine, and we plant a lot of frosty bursine, but this mixture right here is so easy, will grow in uh, 
soils with a pH in the high fives, the amount of uh, phosphorus and nitrogen input is, is low. These plants germinate very quickly and grow well in our region. And this is, I mean, it, it's as easy as, as you can get with regard to food plots. So planted in late summer, here's a plot in, uh, in, in, in fall after planting. And then through the winter at our latitudes, this is what the plot will look like. Green growing, photosynthesizing, extremely uh, palatable and nutritious at this time. And then going into May, the crimson clover flowers and dies. Uh, here's the crimson clover that's already turned red and died. And here's the wheat that's seeded out. And then here comes the air leaf. This is why we put air leaf in this mixture. The air leaf really doesn't start growing well until April. And then by May, it's up here nearly waist high. We go into June, it flowers out, deer are continuing to eat it. They're eating all of the wheat seed heads because we planted an onless variety of wheat and not one with owns. I'll show more pictures of that in just a minute. And then by July, when the air leaf is done, the whole plot is dead. So now you see various quote weeds coming into the plot. Let that sit for a little while. And then by the end of July or second week of August, you can spray the entire plot with glyphosate. It's simple and easy as that. Wait another couple of weeks or so, and by mid to late August, just mow all of the dead material, and the crimson and the air leaf will reseed themselves. And so this is with no additional seed. And, and we have easily driven these plots into the fourth, fifth, sixth year without, without planting any additional seed simply by allowing the air leaf and the, the crimson to reseed themselves naturally. And of course, if you want some additional wheat or oats in the plot, then all you gotta do is, is top sow some of that in there come late August, early September, and uh, you'll have sufficient amount coming in to, to help complement the clovers if, if you want it. Uh, if that's the case, you'll need to plant a little more than the 40 pounds per acre that I had listed. But when you're planting with this mixture, I strongly recommend people do not go over 40 pounds because the, the wheat and oats at that rate will outcompete your clovers. And so somewhere in that 30 to 40 pound PLS rate is where you need to be. Alternatively, if you have grown a warm season plot such as soybeans, and of course, uh, I mean, excuse me, if, if you, uh, another alternative, in, instead of uh, adding air leaf, because air leaf goes into June and July, if you leave it out and you only plant the wheat or oats and crimson clover, and so they are dead by late May, early June, and so here we are drilling our soybeans into the wheat and crimson clover plots, and then here's the plot in August. Of course, the beans are looking good. And by the time the beans are maturing and turning yellow, because we planted the crimson clover the previous fall and it grew, flowered, mature, uh, matured and the seed set, we had that seed already in the soil. And so we don't have to top sow anything on top of the uh, uh, soybeans. And so if there is a deer in the neighborhood, they're going to be in this right here, as well as turkeys. I mean, this, this in my opinion, is, is as good as you can get. Uh, lush, nutritious, clover growing with, with standing beans going into the fall. I mean, this is, uh, this is outstanding. Of course, a lot of people are interested in, uh, in the brassicas or what you might call the greens. Uh, we recommend planting them by themselves or you know, in a mixture of greens. And, and not with uh, clovers, and, and I'll show a picture of that in just a second. But uh, I also try to, to keep these on more loamy and well-drained soils. It's very important to rotate these to a different site after a year, and, and especially if you do them two years in a row, but I wouldn't even do that because of various diseases. Um, and, and they like a lot of fertilizer. So uh, this this to have a really good green plot, you're gonna have to pump the, the phosphorus and, and potassium levels up at least into 
the upper medium range and, and really I like to do it into high range. And, uh, and of course add about 60 units of nitrogen uh, at planting. And then I will come back and add additional uh, nitrogen in, in fall or winter after the greens are on up, you know, 10 to 12 inches tall. And this is why we don't plant the clovers with the brassicas because the clovers, and this is a daikon radish, the clovers are typically shaded out unless you reduce the seeding rate of the brassica so low. And if you do it that low, you know, why include them anyway? And so get the advantage of the brassicas by planting a plot of brassicas. And uh, at least in my opinion, I like to keep the clovers separate because they're not competing. And so here's a, a mixture that we use with uh, radish, rape and, and turnips, and it does real well. And you can use something as simple as, as treflan pre-plant incorporated. It does very good at keeping, you know, some various weeds out. And then of course you can use a grass selective herbicide such as clefidum to, uh, to kill any incoming grasses. Um, don't overlook the value of wheat. Uh, it's just as simple and easy as that. I mean, look, this is outstanding forage for deer. 25% crude protein, only 19% acid detergent fiber, meaning there's a lot of digestible energy here. And of course, this is a selected planting by deer. And this is in a cafeteria style plot with about, uh, I don't know, 20 some other uh, plantings uh, planted alongside. And if you plant an onless variety of wheat, such as this, as opposed to one with the owns or, or beard, if you wanna call it that, then the deer will eat the seed heads. And I, I find this, this is kind of like free food. And at that 30 to 40 pound rate, you're talking about 1200 pounds of wheat seed heads per acre. And so uh, that's, a, that's a great source of energy. The wheat seed heads have, have high energy content, which is very important, especially for lactating does, also for, uh, for bucks at, at that time of year. So th this is a good food to have available to them. And even the crude protein content of the wheat seed head is surprisingly high at 12 to 13 percent. So, you know, that's that's a that's a good food source. And that causes me to plant wheat, certainly instead of rye. And also, especially if I'm uh, interested in turkeys, I oftentimes will use this, although turkeys will eat uh, oat seed heads as well. Um, I generally will lean more towards the wheat than the oats. Um, but but certainly not cereal rye or triticale for that reason. Um, perennial cool season mixtures that uh, we, we strongly recommend and have found highly selected by deer. You can see this blend of ladino, red, clovers, and uh, chicory along with some wheat. And of course that could be 40 pounds of oats as well if, if you wanted. And then post-emergence, you can spray that with pursuit and, uh, and, and clethodum to kill the, the grass weeds. And we tank mix those, the pursuit and the clethodum. We typically spray once in the spring before warm season weeds germinate. And then we spray once in the fall before cool season weeds germinate because the pursuit is soil active and it will act both, both post-emergence as well as pre-emergence. And then of course the clethodum can be applied post-emergence with you know, grass weeds that are actively growing to, to kill them and keep, and keep nice clean looking plots like this if, if you want. Uh, on a little drier site, we like to use alfalfa and red clover along with the chicory. This is an outstanding mixture of course to, to maintain the alfalfa. It, it takes a little more with regard to the uh, uh, nutrient input and, and getting the pH up to 7.0 is, is important. And of course, spraying uh, alfalfa weevils in, in spring and, and when they uh, come around is very important, but that, that's something that needs to be seen to. It's, it's, it's a little more difficult to drive than the clovers, but it's an outstanding forage. And if you also are interested in, in turkeys, I keep going back to that because I bet most of you do like shoot turkeys and, uh, and are trying to manage your properties for turkeys as well. Although clovers hold a lot of insects, I don't believe there's any plant that holds more insects such as leafhoppers and grasshoppers than alfalfa. And that makes these, uh, these plots right here really strongly attractive sites 
for uh, for turkey poults once they get up to uh, at least up, up to a, a few weeks of age where they can get through there and, and get those insects real well. All right, uh, let's talk for just a few minutes about management. Uh, this is something that we've worked with uh, a fair amount here lately and an article or two and maybe a video has gone out in the last few months, but uh, we did some experiments looking at whether regular mowing actually was beneficial or not. And so we took sections of food plots and we mowed some sections and we left some sections unmowed. And we've actually done this for about five years, but I'm gonna show you the results here of uh, this, this past year. Here we see uh, on May the 29th, these are pre-treatment data. And so this is in the portions of the plots that are not going to be mowed. And this is in the portions of the plots that will be mowed. And so then we mowed right here where this black line is. Now we collected the tonnage data as well as nutrition data after the first mowing period on June the 12th, here's in the uh, unmowed and the mowed, by the 26th in the unmowed and the mowed. And then of course, if you read the hunting magazines, you need to mow your perennial food plots at least once a month or, or some something like that. And so we mowed again. You know, it's, it's always interesting to me. They provide all these recommendations and say all these things, but they never show any data. They, they, never, they never provide any data. So here, here's some data for you. So then we mow it again. <clears throat> right here. And so, you know, some dry conditions are coming. And so that the natural amount of clover that is out there, of course, is reduced. Here's in the unmowed sections. Here's in the mowed sections. And, and might I say also, I'm not showing you estimates of total biomass. I'm showing you what we clip off in these frames and dry and send to the lab are portions of the plants that deer commonly eat. And so, for example, in this food plot of alfalfa, red clover, and ladino clover, we're not just clipping it all off at the ground. We're only clipping those portions of the, of the plants that, that deer would eat, not you know, any large ligna stems, for example, of, of alfalfa or, or even red clover. And so what you see is the modes, the, the mode sections never really catch up to the unmowed sections. And then if we look at weed coverage, it's interesting. Now, this is not, this is not many weeds because what did we do prior to this? We sprayed all of these plots. All of these plots were sprayed with clethodum and pursuit. But as you can see, as we get into August and the dry conditions and the clover is going down in productivity, what that does is give more open space for weeds to grow. And so by going into late August, we're looking at 50% coverage of weeds in the mowed plots, as in the mowed sections, as opposed to the unmowed. So we've reported these data for uh, a few years and still people kind of reject this, some people. You know, it, it's like a drug, you know, you've got to mow, right? You just got to mow. Well, no, you don't, you don't have to mow. And so here's, you know, just to look at the plants, the, the clovers and, and the alfalfa up close. And so showing you what the deer are eating. Now, if we look at the nutritional value of the alfalfa, red clover, and ladino, do, do any of you see any advantage nutritionally of mowing? Look at the crude protein value of all of these plants, whether mowed or unmowed. And remember what the maximum crude protein amount that is needed for maximum antler production, that would be 16%. Now it's good to have you know, something greater than that because deer are eating other foods than just this. And so in a mixed diet, of course, having this forage that is you know, 30% crude protein is adding overall to the mixed diet. But the point is, there is no way you could argue that mowing is helping overall increase the nutritional value of these plants. Now, to close the door on this, we put cameras on all of these sections and we monitor deer use of the mowed and unmowed sections. 
and we put a stake out in front of the camera. Uh, I, I think it was at 15 yards from the camera. And we tallied all deer pictures between the camera and the stake to make sure this is all done consistently. So we're not counting deer out here or way back yonder or whatever. It's all within a certain distance. And if we look at the amount of use of mowed and unmowed portions of food plots by deer, you can see that the unmowed portions received about twice as many as the mowed. And then because we had exclusion cages in each one of these sections, and we measured the amount of forage that deer ate by comparing what is in the cage and what's outside the cage at the end of each month, we see that they consumed nearly twice as much forage in the unmowed sections than the mowed sections. So this is not saying that you should never mow your food plots. We mow our perennial food plots once per year, usually in August to early September. And like I said, we will typically uh, spray our perennial plots with the mixture that I told you, the herbicide mixture twice per year, spring and summer. And if you can't or don't wish to, to spray your food plots, yes, more frequent mowing may be necessary in order to literally keep the weeds from uh, taking over the plot. But I hope this shows how you can maintain these plots for a long time without having to get out there, you know, every Saturday in June when, uh, if you're like me, I'd rather be fishing than just mowing a food plot for no good reason. And so moreover, think about this, think about the structure. And so if fawns or turkey poults are out using this type of structure, how vulnerable are they? I think quite. And so have you ever walked into food plots that look like this? And, you know, people see this and say, gosh, Craig, I thought you knew how to manage a food plot. You know, why, why, don't, you, why don't you mow that? Well, uh, the reason is because this structure actually is good. Uh, this provides concealment for poles, for fawns, for adult deer. And as long as I have good clover growth in amongst this, that's all I'm looking for. And so I can mow this, for example, in late summer and prevent these, quote, weeds, although many of them are being eaten as, as about as readily as the clovers, from taking over the plot. I, I prevent them from seeding out and adding more to the seed bank. And you can keep that going for, for many years without necessarily getting out there every you know two to four weeks and, and mow it. So here's just another example of how uh, you know, we've maintained these plots, these perennial plots for many years without uh, regular mowing. And having a plot like this right here is not bad. There's a lot of good in this. The structure is good. And uh, there's a lot of nutrition out there in those plants that you didn't actually plant. Now, there are many that I do not want. And if they show up, I'm getting rid of them. But, uh, but learning the, the value of these is, is very good. All right. Let's talk for just a few minutes about uh, quality deer management. Uh, you wanted me to cover a little bit about that and I'm gonna hit some high spots, but uh, one of the things that bothers me is how many people consider quality deer management just about quote trophies. Well, you know, the trophy is in the eye of the beholder and there's nothing wrong if you want uh, a two-year-old buck, a three-year-old buck or a six-year-old buck, but there's different steps that you would take depending on what uh, you're wanting to get from, from the deer that are occurring on your property. So by definition, the goals are these. That's hard to argue against. Healthy deer, healthy habitat, and increasing hunting excitement. And I put this picture in here, this guy, just a regular guy. Uh, look at the smile on his, fa on his face. He's tickled to death. He's killed a, uh, a three-year-old buck that's gonna score in, in the mid-140s. He's tickled to death. So that's great. And so the, the premise is to manage deer in a biologically and socially sound manner within existing habitat constraints. And that word constraint is important because different areas from Michigan to Illinois to Tennessee to North Florida have different constraints. The objectives are in general to balance the population with the, uh, with the available habitat and that is done with an appropriate doe harvest. Now, what's appropriate on one property is not necessarily appropriate on another. So some areas need additional does killed than others. And there are some properties that they're, you, 
don't need a, a doe harvest, at least for this year, for example. So uh, realizing that your situation is always unique and, and every property is not the same is very important. Of course, you would desire to balance the age structure. Uh, and you do that amongst the males by allowing the young males to walk and, and not killing them, but allowing them to get some, some age on them. Providing additional nutrition through habitat management, which may include food plots that we just talked about, to keep detailed records, and that includes harvest data, as I mentioned, uh, weights uh, by, by sex and age class, and uh, there's a word, age class. How are you going to determine the age class? That involves pulling jaw bones. And so there's another step in your deer management that uh, is, is, is critically important. You, you can't just collect the average weight of does because two-year-old does do not weigh as much as four-year-old does. And so you can't mix all those together. You've got to record whether these are, uh, you know, what the, what the age class of, of the animals are that you're collecting the data from. Observation data from, uh, you know, what you're seeing while you're hunting is, is very important and useful and, and actually more useful than camera survey data. Uh, and I won't get into all that, but if you're interested, let me know and we could talk about that later. And of course, uh, writing down your habitat management data. I mean, I, I can't remember what I sprayed from one field to the next or hardly what I planted. So, you know, keeping a notebook uh, is very important with regard to uh, keeping up with what you've done. And, and what you're doing is, is just allowing the herd to reach its potential by adjusting the numbers of the deer and the amount of nutrition that they have to help you meet your objectives. And so number one question that always comes up is uh, which bucks should I take and, and which should I not? And uh, for the vast majority of people, it's one that protects yearling and two-year-old deer. And now some people might just say, okay, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with a two-year-old buck. Well, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong if you don't want to practice quality deer management at all. But for those who do, at the most minimal level, you want to not shoot the yearlings. And for most people, that would include not shooting the yearlings as well as two-year-olds. In general, you would want to allow the bucks to at least at least three years of age before they're, they're eligible for, for harvest. And you don't want to quote high grade the young bucks. And what that means is shooting either yearlings or two-year-old bucks, for example, that have on average the highest score, Boone and Crockett score, the antler size for their age class or age cohort. Likewise, the restriction should not protect small rack mature bucks. And so if we look here at the distribution of antler size amongst whoop, three, four, and five-year-old bucks, of course, there's a bell-shaped curve. Most two-year-olds, I mean, three-year-olds, as you see here in blue, are going to score somewhere around 100 inches. On, and, and this is these data are from the upper coastal plain of Mississippi. So there's going to be some three-year-olds that only score, you know, 68, 70 inches. There's going to be a few three-year-olds that might score in the 140, but most of them are going to score around 100. And I chose this data set because this is consistent with another that we have collected on the plateau where the average three-year-old deer walking, not the average one shot, scored 100 inches. And so if we look at the average score of four-year-olds, we see it's around 114 inches. And the average score of a five-year-old is 120 inches. But notice that some five-year-olds might only score 80 inches. And some of them, very few, but these are the ones you're really looking for, most of you, would be in the 160s. Keep this bell-shaped curve in mind. And if spikes are prevalent, that's probably because nutrition is limiting or the timing of when that buck was born, not genetics. And I don't have time to get into all that and I'm about to run out of time as it is, but there's always gonna be some spikes in the population. Don't worry about that. You just don't want to see a majority of yearlings, yearling bucks as spikes. If so, then that's overall showing a, uh, uh, a, a nutrient nutrition limitation. So what is the best restriction? With, with, without any question, it is age. And uh, what, again, we strongly 
recommend people to do is, is learn to uh, age deer on the hoof. This is not an exact science, but believe me, in general, this is as easy as counting the antler points. Uh, once you begin to do this and get used to it and start looking at pictures and thinking about this, you will pick up the body conformation and characteristics that are typical of these age classes very quickly. And once you start doing that, as soon as a deer appears and you're on stand, all of a sudden you're looking at its age. You, 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 you haven't even hardly noticed or looked at the antlers. It's just that confirmation hits you as soon as you see the deer. And with this, there are no genetic implications, and this automatically prevents any, quote, high grading of the younger age classes. So, for example, if I go back to this chart, if you selectively shoot three-year-olds that are in the 120s or 130s, look at the ones that you are leaving to get to four years old. And so you are leaving those smaller racked bucks that are three-year-old to become four-year-old. And so over time, you will see a reduction in the antler size by age class, simply because the higher scoring younger bucks were taken. And so here are data. Uh, again, these are from Mississippi off of several WMAs. And the blue is pre-regulation data collected for five years before Mississippi implemented a four-point restriction. The bucks had to have four points before they could be shot. And so in the red, that shows you the average score. And, and these, by the way, are only three-year-old bucks. So here is the average score of three-year-old bucks before the regulation on each of these wildlife management areas. And then here are data from four or five years post-regulation showing how the average score of three-year-olds now has dropped because the higher scoring young bucks have been killed. That shows how antler restrictions with regard to the number of points or a spread or what have you actually can have adverse effects down the road. And so my question is, in looking at this five-year-old buck, why would he not be eligible to shoot? You know, if it's a, you know, 13-inch spread restriction or a uh, you know, if you go to some WMAs out in West Tennessee right now, there's a nine point restriction. So this deer effectively is protected for the rest of his life. And all he is going to do is eat food that other deer could be eating that would be growing larger than him. So there's no reason that this deer should not be eligible for harvest. And lastly, I'll just go through these age classes and, and quickly talk about some of the, uh, the body conformation that, that we would be looking at. And of course, with yearling bucks, you know, we're talking about these uh, dainty type uh, faces, small, uh, thin necks and bodies. And, and look how long the legs appear in relation to the body. Very, very common. And, and, and I threw in one of these. I, I have a whole bunch of them. But here's one of, of deer that uh, was tagged as a yearling. This is obviously a spike yearling buck. And so here is this deer at four and a half years old, showing that, of course, that old thought of once a spike, always a spike is, is of course, of course, nothing but a myth. But I would bet that most of you looking at this would probably shoot this buck right here, a classic four-year-old body shape and showing what even a spike is capable of producing if he's just allowed to live for a few more years. And there's another look at him uh, from a different angle. Two-year-old body, uh, two-year-old bucks, of course, uh, the, the face in general still appears to be a little larger than the neck. The, the neck has not grown that much yet. The legs in relation to the body still have that appearance of, of being uh, fairly long. The stomach and the back, as you can see, are tall. And, and they're starting to get a little muscling in, in the shoulder and, and still with a, with a thin waist. And of course, the antler size can vary. And I'm trying to show you pictures of maybe a small racked one or a larger racked one within that age cohort. With a three-year-old in general, at that point, the face is not 
larger than the neck. The neck has developed, it's relatively full. The, the chest has begun to get deeper. Uh, the legs begin to look more in relation as, as you know, how you figure they might ought to look in relation to the, uh, the, the body. Um, the, the back and the stomach still are taut, but you're, you're seeing a filling out. And, and the, the front now is about as large as, as the back end of, of the animal. And then this is the classic three-year-old body conformation. And you can see how that changes from three going into four. You see more, more depth in, in the neck going into the brisket, a larger neck. You see more of a, of a blocky triangle. Uh, it's, it's not a block, but it's still this triangular shape. But notice the stomach is not sagging yet. The back is not sagging yet. And just, just a, a, a full look, full muscular look. And, uh, you know, this is, this is a nice mature animal. Now, if allowed to go, excuse me, here's another picture of another four-year-old. And another four-year-old looking at the different antler sizes here. Then once you get into the five and five plus year olds, you have typically you will see more of a belly sag, which is not too much, or a back sag on, on these animals here. And, and I'll, I, I should have stated earlier, on all of these animals, they were either tagged or killed and then paired with a jawbone. And again, look at how, you know, we're, we're looking at a five plus year old six pointer here. And here's one from, from Union County that scored 164 inches. And so uh, this is what, you know, a lot of people are hoping for. And on smaller properties, it can be a little more difficult to get because you're having to, to let these deer walk. And, and of course, everybody's wanting to shoot them when they're three years old and scoring 120 inches or, or what have you. But by studying this for a little bit, and I know we're going through it quickly because the time's out, but by studying this a little bit, it doesn't take long to really get the hang of using body confirmation to help you estimate the age, and that helps you get, I think, to where you're wanting to go uh, much quicker and reach your objectives than, than just trying to look at the, uh, the number of antler points or, or the spread. I hope I didn't go too long there, Jason, but I'm happy. very good. Very as good. As long as anybody, as long as anybody has questions, uh, no, no worries.